Patty Gasso just won her fifth national championship in 2021 and is the seventh winningest coach of all time in college softball with an almost 80% winning percentage. Her teams at Oklahoma have won no less than 40 games in a season. With all that winning, Patty felt empty inside. That hole in her heart wasn't trophy-shaped, it was God-shaped. Since then, she's been on a mission to do God's work with the young women she coaches. Patty is a wife of over 35 years, has two sons and grandchildren. Despite the gaudy winning numbers and championships, Patty Gasso remains grounded and understands that she's on this earth to do God's work. My guest was born Patricia Marie Froelich, better known as as Coach Patty Gasso is my guest. Let's go all the way back to Los Angeles, California, where you were born, and maybe get a little bit specific about maybe what part of L.A. that you were born and raised in. Well, I was uh, born in Los Angeles, but raised in Torrance, California, which is about 30 minutes south of Los Angeles. Grew up in a small house, a brother and a sister. My mother and father separated when I was seven years old. So pretty much my mom raised three of us. My brother's two years, three years older, my sister two years younger. We lived right next door to a park. And we would get up in the morning and play all day long. Um, there were times when we would we went to Catholic school. My mom went above and beyond to try to get the money to pay for it. Um, quite honestly, my dad didn't give a lot of money towards the well-being of, her, of his kids, so we were always kind of struggling financially. But my mother worked very hard. And when, at the time of the separation, she didn't have a job. So she, I don't know that many people remember what shorthand was, but it was a, <laughs> a hard way to take notes um, and have to go to, my mom went to shorthand school at night to learn how to be a secretary and take shorthand. And she worked long hours. And um, we used the park as kind of our babysitter. So we didn't really always have somebody looking out for us as kids. We just played all day. And our back door to our house opened up the park. So whenever we needed to go home and eat or whatever, we just walked right back into the gate. And that's how I grew up is just playing a lot at the park, all kinds of different sports and so forth. So it was a, a wonderful childhood um, just for that fact alone. But let's talk about that. When when you were growing up and, and you had that park, um, did you play sports as well? And was it a neighborhood thing? A hundred percent, yeah. I mean, that was a common meeting place. You don't call each other. You don't, there was no texting or anything. The only communication you had was pretty much telephone. But you don't even call. You just, we all show up at the same time. And what was interesting is I was a very kind of quiet and shy kid, but when it came to sports, people would come to me because I was I had I was gifted athletically some. So um, it's just natural to go to the person who is the better player and say, "What are the rules? What are the teams? Who hits first? Who you know shoots first? Whatever." So it was taught me how to be a leader without even knowing that it was teaching me to be a leader leader because I had to make decisions. I didn't ask for them. They asked me for them. And that is when I kind of started to figure out I wanted to be a coach. I wanted to be a teacher. I knew that from a very young age. And my mom grew up in the, uh, she was born in 38. So she was early 50s late 40s, early 50s, she's in high school, and she was a very good athlete, but it was very uncommon for females to play organized sports. There wasn't a lot of it, and it was kind of frowned upon. So she was a kind of a closet athlete that didn't really, you know, let that show. She was more about cheerleading or, you know, um, I don't know, just 
social club. She was very social, very beautiful, uh, had a lot of attention from the men, for the boys, and what have you. So um, I used to listen to the Los Angeles Dodger games with her on the radio. <laughs> if ever it was on TV, we would watch it on TV. She and I grew up in sport together whether it was the Los Angeles Rams back then, it was the Lakers back then. We were sports nuts, and it was always, I got to learn sports from listening to the radio and closing my eyes and visualizing what Chick Hearn or Vince Scully were talking about. And that's really how I got into kind of thinking as a coach, sort of and learning about the game. So my mom would come home from a long day of work and run over to the park, sometimes still in her work clothes, and coach our softball team. And I was always the youngest one. There were always older kids on the team, but my mom really became my coach through my elementary and junior high years. And that was quite an honor and a privilege and what really fired me up to know this is the career I want to go into. That's awesome. Now, do you still have your mom? I do. She is living in uh, Los Angeles. She is dealing with Alzheimer's. So that's a, she's 83 years old. She's been dealing with it for probably about seven years at early stages, but it's starting to get a little more progressive. So it's really been a challenge. For our family, it's really been difficult. But she is walks every day in physical good health. Mental um, is a little different story. Well, I've got another addition to my prayer list, I will tell you that. Thank so you. You're welcome. So as you are growing up and you're playing sports, I'm sure you probably played a lot of baseball. It wasn't because baseball, if it was a bunch of boys, you were playing baseball and not softball, I'm assuming. Um, no, actually, there was a softball league going on over at the park. Okay. And uh, so we did get to play. But I was really, um, I loved softball, but I really loved basketball. And actually, we played, <laughs> if there was ever a college flag football team, that would be my number one sport. <laughs> <laughs> we played a lot of flag football, so the girls did. And it was fun. I loved it. I loved it, um, but it kind of died itself out after elementary school. Um, never got really into volleyball much, and I you would think because it was not too far from the beach, but it was uh, not very prevalent in the area that I grew up in. So uh, basketball and softball were definitely my sport, and knee injuries kept me from advancing my basketball career, but pretty much focused on softball. So let's talk about college softball. You stayed in California uh, to play. Um, And not, uh, obviously, not a whole lot of opportunity even now uh, for softball players to play professionally outside of of when they're done with their college days. But I'm assuming, you know, back in the 80s, uh, there was even less opportunity. Uh, So had you already moved on to maybe being a coach and not playing softball professionally after you were done playing in college? Yeah, there was really no professional sports. And if it was, it was not making any money. It was more like exhibition. So I played my college years at Long Beach State, which is um, not far from where I grew up at all. Drivable for sure. But I um, worked um, I would practice, um, I'd go to school, well, let me back it up, I'd, I'd go to workouts at 6.30 in the morning, have classes from 8 to 12, practice from 2 to 5, and then go, I worked at a pizza parlor slash pub type place <laughs> from like 6.30 to midnight and then go home and get up and do it all over again. And back then, it was not a chore for me. I never complained about it because I wanted to play softball, but I needed the money to be able to live close to the university. I was getting a very small scholarship. There weren't full scholarships back then. It was small chunks of books and tuition and partial 
you know, partial tuition books and maybe that's it. So now you're like, how am I going to eat and how am I going to, where am I going to live? So I had to work to help make ends meet. My mom just didn't have the money to allow me to do that. And my dad pitched in some, enough that I could live close to the university and still do what I wanted to do. But I would, I would do it all over again because I wanted, that was my dream, and I would do whatever I had to do to, to make it happen. You mentioned that you went to a Catholic school. Let's start talking about that building of your, of your faith and how that happened. Um, were you a family, even just with the four of you, uh, with your mom? Were you at church every Sunday? What was your church like like early? If I can be honest with you, not very good. Um, <laughs> we would go on Sundays when we were really young, and I remember dressing. You got to dress to the T. I mean, we, you would really dress up for it. And then as we got older, that started to dissipate some. So it was more going for um, holidays more than anything. When I really, um, really found myself in my relationship with Christ was when um, I was out of college. When I met my husband, um, a couple friends as well kind of, turned me on to Christianity and get, got me to really understand what it meant. Although my family was not very religious, I do remember turning on Billy Graham and watching him preach on television, black and white, and my family saying things like, oh, what are you, like a Jesus freak now? Because that was a very common word back then, or a common mm-hmm. phrase. And so I was almost had to hide if I wanted to watch or listen to Billy Graham. And I still listen to him today. I thought he was just a fabulous teacher, one of the best to ever live, without question. And so um, I wanted to know more, and my husband, thank goodness, was a um, very strong Christian, and that led me to other people in my life that were related to soccer that taught me a lot about Christianity and the Bible and um, just really got me to where I am today. Let's go back to meeting Jim, and you you give us whatever details that you would like. How did you meet, and how long did you date before you were married? I'll make it short and sweet. Okay. (laughs) Uh, We met at, at Long Beach State. I was in a golf class with his brother, and I didn't know that that was his brother. And Jim, Jimmy, was in my class, and he was kind of the class clown, and it really, I didn't know him, but he aggravated me, because I wanted to get out of the class quick, and he would be the one asking ridiculous questions <laughs> to try to get back. So, I knew him as the, the class clown that I was kind of aggravated with. While I was playing golf, um, his brother was like my partner in the class. And they started, I saw them talking together. And then I said, how do you know that guy? And he's like, oh, it's my brother, Jim. And I'm like, oh, no, no way. (laughs) (laughs) So um, he asked his brother, he wanted to meet me. And we just, he would come into the place that I worked. Um, in the evenings because he knew I worked there and we just kind of hit it off and started talking and the rest is history. 35 years later, it's history. That's awesome. My wife and I are about to hit 30. Was it ever contentious in your relationship that, that, that Christ was a part of Jim's life and you wondered where you could fit in? At times, you know, we are both, he was a coach as well. He's still coaching, um, like travel ball team, uh, softball team area that we, uh, facility that we own. We're very competitive and against each other very much. And that does get in the way. But I knew that I wanted him to go to Catholic church with me. I wanted to go to church more, but all I knew was the Catholic church. And he's like, I'm not going to Catholic church. You're going to have to go with me if you want to go to church. So we were kind of going back and forth. 
and I surrendered, thank goodness. Um, <laughs> and when we would, it was just odd for me to go to a church where you're not kneeling or, you know, sitting in the hard pews. These were more like, like movie seats, and it felt really awkward and odd to me. Um, but I really it took me about a full year to surrender understanding and he was the coach like okay look you 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 have to do this and you have to do that and I'm like personally like don't tell me what to do kind of <laughs> <laughs> so yes it was contentious for a bit but I really really would wa- I would watch people getting baptized and I was enamored by that and I just learned a lot about the Holy Spirit and the Holy Spirit, when you surrender your life, the Holy Spirit comes in and leads you. Um, and I wanted to know what that felt like and I couldn't understand it. And, um, I really began a strong prayer life and just asking the Lord to reveal the Holy Spirit to me and make me understand. And, um, one of the most unbelievable things in my life was, um, Knowing when the Holy Spirit came into my life, I was coaching. I was actually in the third base coaching box in Fullerton, California. And I just remember feeling, just I physically felt the Holy Spirit coming into my life and into my heart. And I'll never forget it. And as soon as that game was over, I ran home and told Jimmy, like, I get it. I understand it. Uh, I know I'm a child of God. I know I'm going to be led. The rest, of my life. I, I knew all of that. It just, it was an amazing feeling that I wanted to shout from the mountaintop. <laughs> but it took me a while to get there because I was so prideful and had an ego and didn't want anyone to tell me what to do. And um, I thank the Lord for humbling me and giving me the ability to to listen. Talking with Patty Gasso, she is uh, far and away uh, the winningest coach in OU softball history. I don't, I don't even know where number two even fits into that. But she's also the seventh winningest coach ever in college softball. Has the highest winning percentage uh, ever for anyone that has coached college softball. She's won five national championships, including uh, one just recently. And so, let me ask you, uh, Patty, about. All of that, um, all those numbers, uh, thirteen over thirteen hundred wins in in college softball, and and now twenty seven years at the University of Oklahoma. When you started coaching softball, did you have any goals like that in mind? Uh, not really. No, um, I my first couple of years I mean we had success but the teams that were the elites were UCLA and Arizona and they would beat the pulp out of us so I knew I had to find out how to get more athletes like they have and I was just always searching for what it would take to win and I thought that we had a good uh, mindset we had a good culture we had good practice I just needed to get the right players that fit. And coaching really became hard for me, specifically after we won our first national championship in 2000. We had success a few years after, and then we kind of hit this skid mark where we did not get to the World Series for a while. And I was really, once you win it all, that's all you taste and that's all that you want is the opportunity to do it again and do it again and do it again and do it again. And that's the competitive spirit that goes in with it that almost gets addicting. And it got to a point where I really did not enjoy coaching because of the pressure of trying to get to the World Series. And I really thought, I can't do this anymore. I don't want to do this anymore. I'm not happy doing this. I've got kids and I'm not handling any of this right i'm not a good mom i'm not a good coach i'm just not doing a very good job of any of it and i really you know the lord came in and said you've got this all wrong you are doing this all wrong 
You are not here. This is not about you to be at OU to win games. We, I don't care. This is the message I'm <laughs> I don't care about that. You are here to open the door and get allow me to get into the door of some of the hearts of your players. And when I realized my job was more to help win souls than win games is when my whole world turned around as a coach. And I went from hating what I was doing to having more passion than ever because I had good people in place that could help these things happen. And it's not me standing in front of my team and preaching, but it's giving them opportunities to have the right people in the right places if, if needed. And the players started to reach out through FCA, um, through chapels that we have on Sundays offered to everyone. It's optional always. But it's not me preaching. It's our players just gravitating to each other and leading each other. And the only thing I'm doing is making, you know, some opportunity for that to happen through other people. Um, so there were times when I was having Bible studies at my house and I had a couple of players go to administration and say, this isn't right. She treats the players that are there different than they treat those that don't go. And that hurt my heart, hardcore. But I knew that that meant that I had to incorporate others into this equation and they're still in it. Um, 20 years later, they're still the same people in the same place and uh, helping our players understand uh, about relationships with Christ. Um, sitting here with goosebumps, because when I, I hear somebody talking about that, it, it just makes my heart happy because if I were to ask Patty Gasso, who are you? I know that the words coming out of your mouth would be, I'm a child of God, not I'm the head softball coach at Oklahoma, not that I'm the seventh winning. None of that would come out. And, and I know that. And I think that's so awesome. But I understand that you win that championship and then it becomes about that moving forward. And, and that's so wonderful to hear uh, what you went through. Um, I guess I would have been what, probably 15, 16 years ago that, that that happened. Yeah. You know, it just, I'm glad that my ears were listening, but I was, I was at a place, I was at a crossroads where I thought, "I, I can't do this. I can't coach at this level, not here, not with expectations. I, I, I was so caught up in winning, and I hated everything about it. So it's interesting when you pop, you know, you throw out the numbers, and I don't even know. This is the first time you're saying things that I have, I have not heard before or I don't pay attention to because you are right. I the College World Series is an avenue to reach more people. So every time we go into the World Series, this team is playing for something that others want to know what we're playing for. And that is how we're using this platform. And people are wondering and wanting to know what the story is about. And when it's shared, people are shocked. But it's getting in their ears. And it's getting in on their eyes. And I think we're, you know, uh, our players, I mean, I, I, I know this is, you're talking about me, but our players are, are getting that platform and they are taking it and running with it. And it is, I'm so prideful to tears. And I don't know what their post-game press conference sounds like or they're on ESPN with Holly Lowe and they're giving the glory to God right out of the, right out of the gate. And these are kids that I would never, they don't come to chapel or they aren't, um, in my mind, I, I'm, I'm not understanding that God is even in their mind, but they're the first thing they're saying. 
on national television. So those are the victories. I don't, you know, trophies are great. I don't wear rings. I don't boast around the trophies. It's those things, the baptisms that are happening during the season. It's watching your athletes use their platform to give glory to God. Those are the victories. Those are the victories that will never go away, that will always live in my heart. Because they're reaching people, and that is our job here. And they, there's a lot of them are getting that. Yep, yep. We're here to to uh, get to heaven and take as many people with us as we can. So I got to have you explain that for those who didn't watch any of it. Which, uh, boy, so many eyes were turned towards the women's college world series um, that concluded recently. It's it's incredible. Really, a great boost for the sport, and I know for the University of Oklahoma, but. They were raising the num- the four fingers for four. Tell the listeners what that indicated. Yeah, well, it started um, started in a lot of different ways. So um, we we really talked a little bit about the three mighty men in in the Bible and what they brought to like as they go to war and. Just the leadership component, the I got your back component, and the I will never quit on you component. I will always be the last one standing when no one else will. So it was kind of understanding the power of three. And then one of our athletes said, well, you have to bring God into that equation. So now it's the power of four. So the number was four. Grace Lyons is a very strong, young, phenomenal Christian girl, was wanting to incorporate the word battle, but it's B-A-T-L, and that stands for both about the Lord. <laughs> and that, is, that was their motto, but they took the A in battle and turned it to the number four. So you kind of incorporating a lot of things <laughs> in one it was in one t shirt. So you could see our family members wearing them, parents wearing them, friends were wearing them. Um, our players are making battle cheers. Um, it it was quite incredible. But our players shared this story on social media and a lot of them did a great job of using their uh, expertise and social media and their followers got to hear what the real story was about. And now you're hearing about kids wearing a battle shirt and holding up the number four and uh, it's happening around the country. And it's like, wow, just God could spread this word like mad. (laughs) And uh, that's where I guess sometimes I'm not a big fan of social media, but in those ways, it's incredible how it can get across the country. And our players have been the voices of it, and I've been more than proud of them having the courage to do it, not backing down. Well, Patty, thank you so much for your time. This has been so awesome. and uh, First time I've actually gotten to talk with you um, person to person. I've been around Oklahoma sports for a long time, and I've been in the same um, room with you before, uh, but we've never had a chance to speak person to person. And I'm so grateful for this. And what a what a blessing you are to so many people. And um, I, I thank God for what you're doing at the University of Oklahoma. And I know so many other people do too. And again, thank you for being a part of this program. Well, I appreciate you having me. And the one thing I'll say is I don't know that I could be doing this as freely in any other state but Oklahoma. And so that's why I love being here, why our team, when they graduate, they don't leave Oklahoma because they are so rooted in the people and the values, and um, they're just so invested here. So. I'm just honored to be an Oklahoman (laughs) and uh, being able to have the freedom to do the things we do here. So thank you for having me. I really appreciate it. My thanks to Patty Gasso for being on Suit Up. For more outstanding conversations, just go to suitup611.com.
and God bless.